Hi everyone! Today on All About You, we are talking about a subject that relates to every woman. From an early age, we heard about the need to visit our gynecologist and many women find this very scary. When is the right age to visit our gynecologist? How often should you get checked up? Today, Rafaela sits with Dr. Dumpert, who answers all these questions for us. Have a look. Hello, ladies. I'm here today at Montero Clinic, and I'm going to be visiting a gynecologist, Dr. Dumpert. She'll be answering some questions to us today. Are you ready? So, come along. How long have you been a gynecologist? Oh, I've been a gynecologist for, well, I finished medical school 10 years ago and then I did my training to become a gynecologist for six years. Mm -hmm. So for four years, I've now been a, um, like a full gynecologist. Okay. Can we go through our questions? Of course, yeah. Okay, that's good. So Dr. Dumper, when should a woman have to book an appointment, the first appointment with a gynecologist? Yeah, so that depends a little bit. All the guidelines are a bit different in different countries. Generally, I would say, here in England, you know that women don't usually go to gynecologists unless they have a problem. In other countries, sometimes once they start being sexually active. I think it's probably a combination of both. So if a young woman that's not sexually active and doesn't have any problems, usually doesn't need to come in. But once you start being sexually active, you would like to talk about contraception, or even if you're planning to become sexually active in the future, it's better to book an appointment earlier rather than later. Also, of course, if there are any problems with the periods or with any discharge or anything else really, then of course it's good to I think is that is uh, any age, a uh, proper age to come? I think if there's none of these issues that I just mentioned, it's not absolutely necessary to come in. It might be a good idea if there is something, for example, just met somebody and you're thinking about starting a relationship, to come in rather a bit earlier, to discuss things first, to get to know the gynecologist as well, to help with, there might be a bit of fear around the visit, that you've already overcome all of that. So once you really need to talk about problems, you can come in and obviously it's, it's good especially with contraception to be prepared to to take the contraception before you start being sexually active. There are other interesting questions here because some women doesn't have the courage to ask about it but I think it's interesting. Someone saying here I am never in the mood what could be causing and low libido? Yeah that's also a very frequent question that that um, patients come in with and it's true not a lot of women feel the courage to ask that question especially not to their GP or somebody who also might know the partner or the family a bit better. Um, yeah so, so for low libido or like low mood and interest in having sex there's a lot of different reasons for that. Some can be physiological like there might be an actual physical issue that's preventing women from enjoying sex. For example, the vagina can be a bit dry, there might be a bit of an infection, there might be something like a skin disorder on the, on the vagina that makes it uncomfortable and that's why women don't want to have sex. But sometimes there's also some medication somebody is taking. For example, even the contraceptive pill can make women to have a lower libido and that's something that's not that well known but it's actually quite common. Of course there might also be psychological factors, for example there might be some underlying problem with the relationship. So it's important to look at everything and then see, see how, to, how to help that individual. So there is another question that a lot of women maybe they have been interested to know about contraceptives. We know that some women say, oh, I don't want to take it because, you know, I can gain a lot of weight. I don't know if it is, we want to know if this is true, if all the medications, contraceptives are like this mm -hmm. or if it is a myth. What do you want to say to us about it? Yeah, that's also a really important question because a lot of women, women struggle with, with weight gain. Obviously, they don't want to take anything that will increase that even further. Generally, they did a lot of studies on all the different pills and different methods of contraception. And generally, the only one that's really been shown to, to increase weight gain, not by a lot, but some kilos over the years, um, is the injection, the three months injection. So that's really been proven to, to cause weight gain. 
all the other hormonal methods, they can um, lead to some women feeling a bit bloated and like water retention. That's why they feel maybe a little bit heavier, but they don't generally lead to weight gain. But individually, some women actually notice a difference and then it's good to come back in and we can change it to somebody else, something else. If some women don't um, are not happy with hormonal contraception at all, but there are also other methods like the like the IUD, the coil that get that puts inside the uterus, and there is one without hormones and that doesn't influence the weight at all. So so there are a lot of options. What can a woman do? What she can do to make sure she gets to her menopause time, and there is and have no symptoms. Yeah, also very important. It's obviously a very important phase in a woman's life, menopause, and it's good to be prepared for it beforehand. I think a lot of it is about having the right information, knowing a little bit when to expect the menopause, what to expect, to not be to be a bit prepared, to not be so surprised. And then I think it is a time for a woman to really start looking after themselves more or if they've already done it, to just continue doing that, to really take time for themselves, to try to... A lot of women are very busy during that time. They usually have children and jobs and husband, and they just, you know, there's a lot of things going on. And it is a time, I think, that's actually, is a challenge, but it's also a big chance to to see what your life, which way it's want, it wants to go, and for you to find out a bit more how to look after yourself, how to find time to, to rest a little bit in between, to look after yourself well. And I think that includes being physically active, like doing sports or going for walks, also eating well is really important, especially during that time. If a woman found out she's pregnant, she has to, do you think she has to go look for a GP? Uh, she has to go to GP first, but then it's important to go to the gynecologist, isn't it? Yeah, so that depends a little bit from country to country as well. So you know here in England, it's usually all led by GPs and the GPs refer to midwives and they then would refer to an obstetrician, like that's what gynecologists are called during, during pregnancy, and um, if there are any complications. And a lot of other countries is different and a lot of other European countries and in other parts of the world, a woman sees her gynecologist when she's pregnant. Here in England, I think it's not... 100% necessary because the way the system is set up is usually that the GP will organize everything. But it depends a little bit on the woman's expectations and also how much support um, she feels she needs. It is generally quite nice to see when it's somebody you've already known before or you can start building up a relationship, you can come back and see him or her regularly and you can also come a little bit earlier in pregnancy. Usually with GPs the for some of the first ultrasound scan is around 12 weeks and then the the um, appointments are quite spaced out in the beginning of pregnancy whereas um, if you see a gynecologist um, in a practice you can see him or her a little bit earlier at around eight weeks to have an early pregnancy scan to make sure everything is going well which can be quite nice for women for reassurance you can also talk earlier about what kind of lifestyle is right in pregnancy what what and nutrition is important so you can start the whole process a little bit earlier plus you have somebody if something comes up like for example bleeding or pain or a lot of things that can happen especially in the early stages of pregnancy where you can turn to where you can go to and get an ultrasound scan for example for reassurance or just discuss questions as well this interview is clarify a lot of doubts I'm sure you know understand more about what to do to take better care of yourself. We have heard from Dr. Dumpert, but now it is the turn of those on the street of London. Sabrina is speak with a few to find out what they think of gynecologists. Take a look. Hello ladies from All About You. Yes, we were actually trying to do some street chats, but then this happened. The rain came down. So we came to a man-free office to find out if these ladies know how to take care of themselves. How often should a woman visit the gynecologist? Um, about two to three times a year. Twice a year. Every year? Mm -hmm. 
What is the pep test for? Um, I don't know what that is. I have no idea. Never heard of it. Yeah. <laughs> and what is the normal menstrual cycle of a woman? Um, I would say between 28 to 30 days. Do you mean how long it lasts? No. How I don't know. <laughs> 30 days. And what does PMS mean? Um, I'm not entirely sure, so I'm going to say what I think it is. Um, Pre-menstrual symptoms? Pre-menstrual tension. I, I don't know anything. Sorry, oh I don't goodness. know. <laughs> Now we go back to Rafaela and Dr. Dumpert for more questions. Dr. Dumpert, what's the best way to check one's breast at home? What's the sign should we women look for? Yeah, also very important. So um, breast health in general is a little bit overlooked often by women and it is important to check the breast yourself. The best time is usually just after the period well, if a woman doesn't have periods for whatever reason, then once a month. Because after the period, the, the breast tissue is a little bit softer and it's easier to feel any, any small lumps or changes. And it is quite important to do it regularly so that you become kind of breast aware, you know your own breast and you would notice any changes. Because it is important to realize that a lot of the time it's the woman herself who finds breast cancer in the early stages so it is actually important to be aware and to notice changes and then go and see a doctor immediately the changes to look out for is usually something like a like a lump like a hard kind of area that hasn't been there before and that doesn't change with the cycle that stays for for more than one cycle, so one period to the next period, and doesn't go away with the hormonal changes. So that's the main thing. But there's also other signs. Sometimes it's just a feeling of um, that the skin is changing a little bit, a bit of a redness, or just a change of the surface of the skin that can mean that there is an underlying underlying problem. Or sometimes it's a bit of discharge from one of the nipples. It can just sometimes be a little bit of, of an ongoing discomfort. So the symptoms are quite vague. With that, I don't want to scare women to, to think that they might have breast cancer when they don't. But it is important to realize that if there's anything that has changed and it doesn't go away again after one cycle, after one more period, to just rather be on the safe side and come in and, and be checked out. Is discharge normal? Um, when should I be worried about it? Yeah, very important as well. A lot of women worry about the discharge from the vagina. They think there's something wrong or they're worried about the smell. Um, generally, having discharge is completely normal and it is normal to have some kind of smell in, in the genital area in the vagina. A lot of women, not knowing that, start using um, products to clean themselves and to clean inside the vagina, which actually is not very healthy. It's better to just leave the vagina just inside the vagina, just leave it alone. Washing on the outside is fine, but on the inside there is quite a, quite a delicate balance of, of um, bacteria and they're better left alone because they, are, they fulfill an important function to clean the vagina and to protect it from infections. If the discharge changes, so if it's suddenly a lot more or the smell suddenly gets a lot different or the color changes, it's instead of white, it's a bit greenish or yellowish, then it's a good idea to come in and be tested for different, different infections. Sometimes it's a sign that there's just a bit of an imbalance of the bacteria and it's very easily treated, but sometimes it is a sign that there might be an underlying infection that could potentially have more serious side effects, for example, chlamydia infections that in the long term can lead to infertility. Okay, there is other question here saying, I wear jeans most days. Is that bad? I wear tight clothes. What about underwear? Which one's the suitable one? Which materials are the best for us, you know, for our health? 
Yeah, so generally, um, the more natural the fiber is, like cotton or silk or anything like that, it's usually much better because it lets the body breathe. All the synthetic fibers, they're usually a bit more, um, they cause the body to sweat a bit more and um, that then can lead to infections like yeast infection like thrush or, or things like that or skin irritation. So it's probably better to, especially for the underwear, to rather wear cotton underwear and also to wash it with, with wash powder that's kind of quite gentle and not too, without too many chemicals. Um, with regards to jeans, it's probably fine. The only thing is if it's very tight, then sometimes that can also lead to more sweating in the area, which potentially can increase the risk for thrush more. Talking about period, you know, a lot of women have a, a lot of pain during the period. I don't know if this is common, it's natural, or it's something that women shouldn't suffer. What do you have to do to avoid, you know, this pain and also the hair flow that comes sometimes in the period. Yeah, that's also very important. A lot of women really do suffer from heavy and painful periods. It depends a little bit. There is a range of what's normal. So some women, for some women, the periods are very light and, and not very painful. And that's just the way they are. And for some women, they feel it more. But very painful and very heavy periods shouldn't be something that a woman just puts up with. I would definitely recommend that she goes and see a gynecologist for that problem. There are some underlying issues that can that can make that can cause that problem or make it worse. And it is important to to look into all the possible causes to then help the woman with it. There is something, for example, called fibroids, where there's a growth on the uterus that makes the that can make the periods very heavy and also more painful. There is another um, medical condition called endometriosis that can make the periods very painful. So it's important to look into into the potential causes and then find either something that can be treated or just to rule out that there is anything that needs treatment, and then with regards to how to deal with it. So obviously if we find something that can be treated, we just really address the cause. And by addressing the cause, hopefully afterwards, the woman will feel much better. If everything is normal, so far as we can see, there's still a lot of things we, that we can do, just treatment wise, either with medications or without, to help the woman feel better during her period. So, Dr. Dumper, thank you so much for answering our questions. But now, our viewers would like to know more, maybe, or the questions they have. What do we have to do to make an appointment with you? Yeah, so that's very easy. They can just contact the Montairo Clinic and just book an appointment with me. So just either say my name or just request an appointment with a gynecologist. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. That's it for today. And then we are back to the studio now with Claudia. Thank you. Bye-bye. We see that many women avoid having checkups because they are afraid. Many discover the problem when it is the too late. The same applies with all the fears in your life. You cannot allow fear to dominate you. You have to confront all your fears and overcome them. Until next week, when we are back with another All About You. See you next time. Bye.